you'll open your Bibles to the book of Acts in chapter 7, those of you who are somewhat familiar with Scripture might recognize we're looking today at Brother Stephen to start with, this young man who was preaching the gospel, and after he had preached the gospel, many people rose up against him, and in verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Must have been a murderous scene to think about. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, approximately the same age, I believe, as Stephen. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Thorough was he in committing this heinous act against the innocent Christians in the city of Jerusalem. Stephen was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit who had just preached one of the greatest sermons in the New Testament. It was a magnificent piece of work. Brilliant was Stephen in the way he connected the old history of the Jews to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a beautiful piece of work. Stephen was also a Jew. So Saul of Tarsus hears this beautiful sermon from his fellow Jew and chooses not only to reject the truth, but to also consent to Stephen's murder by stoning. Mark this place in your Bibles, if you will. We'll come back near it. In the meanwhile, let's turn to Acts chapter 26. <clears throat> and let's look at verses 9 through 11. Paul writing about himself some years later. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. What a terrorist the apostle Paul was before he became a Christian. But we can't give up on Saul because Christ is the minister of second chances. No matter how dastardly this man was, no matter that he murdered, that he imprisoned, that he persecuted Christians, Christ still wanted his soul. Christ didn't give up on him, and Christ is going to give him another chance. In Acts 9, 1 through 9, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? 
And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with Saul stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank, no doubt engaged in prayer. And then later in the story, he would be baptized into Christ. Here's a man who consented to Stephen being put to death for preaching the very gospel that he would obey in the city of Damascus. This is the ministry of second chances. After his baptism, the Bible says in Acts 9, he immediately began to preach in Damascus. He's like Stephen. You're the new Stephen. You know the fellow that you consented to stoning to death? That man who preached the gospel in Acts 7? You're the new him. Eventually, known as the Apostle Paul, he would write 13 books in the New Testament. I'd like to turn to the book of 1 Timothy in chapter 1 and read a few verses about what this man said later in his life, about his former life. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, And I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant and with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Christ gave Paul a second chance. And then Paul did what his Lord did. He gave others a second chance. I got a second chance. Remember me? Acts 8. And then I got a second chance. Acts 9. Now I'm going to give the world the same thing Christ gave me. I'm going to give them a second chance. Let's go back to the book of Acts in chapter 14. And we'll read a few verses starting in verse 19. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. We're in the city of, city of Lydda, or Lydia, or Lydda. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, he made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Not Lydia or Lydda, I'm sorry. Lystra. Lystra. The city that tried to kill Paul is given another chance. They stoned him, and supposing him to be dead, they dragged him out of the city. Well, the last verse we read shows us in verse 21, he returned to that very city. The people who were engaged in his execution, allegedly, were from Iconium and Antioch, and that's exactly where he returned to. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Paul went right back to the scene of the crime. People who did to him what he helped do to Stephen were given a second chance. I got a second chance. I'm going to give others a second chance. Might not be safe. Let's think about it. If I was in Lystra when they persecuted me to the point of stoning me to the point they thought I was dead and dragged me out of the city, 
How safe is it for me to go back to that very same place? Well, that takes some faith. I've been there before. I didn't get good results. I think I'll stay out of that place. That place doesn't hold any love for me. That place almost killed me. I was killed except for a miracle from God. They thought I was dead. I don't think I'll go back there. But Paul could always remember the Lord went back there for you. The Lord went back there for you. He gave you a second chance. You be full of the faith. You go back to Lystra and keep preaching the gospel. Simon the sorcerer was given a second chance in the book of Acts chapter 8. Jonah was given a second chance under the old law. David was given a second chance after committing adultery. Jesus Christ gives people second chances. We need to remember that, be thankful for it, and remember to put it to work because sometimes people don't want to become Christians. And sometimes later, they might change. Matthew chapter 26. Verses 42 through 47. Again a second time he's praying in Gethsemane. Jesus went away and prayed saying, Oh my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found the apostles asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, and let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priest and the elders of the people, and the betrayer of Jesus was at hand. You know, he got snuck up on here because he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the apostles are supposed to keep guard. You stay awake while I go over here and pray. And while he's over here praying, they fell asleep. And here comes the guard dog. Here comes Judas and the band that's coming with him. And the people who were supposed to be watching for this are asleep on the job. But he gave them another chance. He gave Peter a second chance after the rooster crowed. Second chances are a hallmark of Christ's ministry. And now let's go to Luke chapter 4 and watch our master at work. We'll close the lesson looking at this point. When we look at Paul, when we look at the ministry of the apostles in the first century, we see them giving people a second chance. But that pattern that they're executing originated from the ministry of our Lord, and we're going to see it demonstrated right here in Luke chapter 4. We'll start reading in verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down in the synagogue in Nazareth where he was preaching. And all the eyes were on him in the synagogue. They were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, 
you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. He had been rejected by those in Nazareth where he grew up. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months. And there was a great famine throughout all the land, but to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down the cliff. Throw him over the cliff. Just get rid of this man who doesn't preach things we want to hear. Luke chapter 14, verses 18 through 29. This marks the second time that Jesus has gone to Nazareth since he turned 30 and his public ministry began. We know that he grew up in Nazareth, a carpenter's son, and early after he started his ministry, he began to preach there. And so this is the second time that he's gone back to Nazareth. His people, the Jews, were so narrow-minded and bigoted that they found themselves superior and arrogant. Between them and the Gentiles was a wide gulf. Samaria was so accursed that the Jews traveling between Galilee and, and Judea would cross to the east side of the Jordan to avoid being contaminated by Samaria. That's where the Jews live. So we're going to cross on the other side of the river, go out of our way, cross the river, go up to Judea so we don't have to see or smell or mess with the sorry people, the Gentiles, who are ungodly, who worship idols. God has separated us from them and we are no doubt superior to them because God said so. And they took the law of God speaking to the separation of Jew and Gentile. And they took it out of context and made it something much more radical than God ever attended. They thought they could avoid being contaminated by the Gentiles by not going through their land. And that was the Jewish religion in the first century. <laughs> this is the attitude of the Jews that Christ is dealing with in his hometown of Nazareth. But Jesus, in this sermon in the synagogue, talks about two things that stirs up their ire. First, there's the story of the days that God worked in the life of a widow who was a Gentile the widow of Zarephath. She received special blessings from God, but she was a Gentile. Hello, you got your head in the game here. Next, God passed over all the lepers in Israel to heal this one leper named Laman. Who is he? A Syrian. What's a Syrian? A Gentile. So in this sermon, he preaches on two people, Naaman and Zarephath, and both of them were Gentiles. He's building a ground on this. We're about to take away the wall of separation. There's not going to be any difference in, in very much time between the Jews and the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter went to Cornelius' house, they were astonished that the Holy Spirit had fallen on the Gentiles just like the Spirit had fallen on the Jews. This is the day that's coming. And all this was written down 
in their book, the book they handed to him, the book he read from, the book he handed back to the attendant, the verses we just read, but like many religious people, the Nazarenes didn't pay much attention to the things in their book. Christ preaching about a Sidonian widow and a Syrian general in our holy synagogue, it infuriated them so much they tried to kill him in a gruesome way. Just push him over the cliff. Get rid of this guy. Verse 29, they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. We're not even going to bother to pick up stones and stone this man. Just push him over the cliff like refuge. Just get rid of him. He's garbage, trash. Just throw him away. Can you imagine that people treated the Son of God like that? But his love gave people a second chance. You would have thought he would have shaken the dust off Nazareth from his feet. Instead, he's back. Didn't you come through here before? Weren't you greeted with a lot of hostility before? Why would you come back to this place? Because he loves people. And he wanted to give them one more chance. They weren't worthy of it. He's done that before in his ministry. Will you turn to John chapter 11? And look at verses 7 and 8. And after he said this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples, reasoning as man does, said, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going back? You want to go there again? These people hate you. These people are conspiring to murder you. They've charged you with blasphemy, and they want to stone you to death, and yet you want to go back to that place? The, dis the disciples couldn't believe the, what they were hearing. What are you thinking? They'll take advantage of this opportunity and only try to kill you again. But Christ was going back because that's indicative of his love. We've got to give them one more shot. I want them in heaven. They're not going to heaven without me. So I need to put myself in their place and preach to them one more time and see if we can rescue some more souls out of this place. He gave the woman caught in the very act of adultery a second chance. He gave second chances to a lot of people, including a lot of people who sit in this building. Amen. He gave a lot of people sitting in this building second chances because this is the ministry of second chances. You might need a second chance today or a third or a fourth and we'll help you with that need if you'll let us in a matter of moments because we're just about through. I'd like to close by going to the last book in the Bible and read some verses from Revelation chapter 3 starting in verse 14. This letter Christ wrote to the Laodiceans. These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent, 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now you know the theme of this lesson. Let's make a quick application. It's stunning. Christ gave another chance to a church he called wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is who he is. This is what he does. This shows us his love. Couple that with the story of the cross. You learn more about and appreciate our Savior. This is what he does. Even though you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, he gives you a chance to repent that you may be rich and clothed in white garments that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and that you can sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. I'm going to forget that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, and I'm going to give you honor like you couldn't get from any man upon this earth. I want to be that good to you in spite of who you are because this is the ministry of second chance. These people have obviously already been baptized into the Lord's name because he calls them members of the church of the Laodicea. Still giving them second chances. Still loving them. Still holding out. You still don't have it just right. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to give you another chance to get it right. We should be thankful for second chances. And be prepared to give others second chances because we helped ourselves to those second chances. If God gave us second chances, and he did, wouldn't it be appropriate for us to give second chances to others? That's what Paul did. Paul didn't take his salvation, in other words, and say, well, I got what I want. I'm saved. I'm going to preach the gospel to you. If you don't believe it too bad, that's your business. I got what I want. I got what I want. Who cares about you? I preached to you. You didn't believe it. Done with it. Finished. Boy, if that was the way we thought, we wouldn't have very many people in this building today. Because a lot of us needed those second chances. And there's a lot of people out there that need second chances just like we do. If you need a second chance today, I want to start over. Come to the front at this time while we stand here. <laughs>